When Israel came out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people who spoke a foreign language, Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled, the Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. Why was it sea that you fled, Jordan that you turned back, mountains that you skipped like rams, hills like lambs? Tremble earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool, the flint into a spring. In 2012, the Mississippi River, the mighty Mississippi, flowed backwards for nearly 24 hours. Strong winds from Hurricane Isaac pushed the water back where it came at a rate of 182,000 cubic feet per second. Pretty windy. It wasn't the first time that the Mississippi flowed backwards. 200 years earlier, for a two to three month period between 1811 and 1812, three major earthquakes hit the state of Missouri. They were all above 7.0 in magnitude. There are records of the quakes being felt as far as Canada, not to mention all around the United States. The seismic shift there uh, on that fault created waterfalls on the Mississippi River and, for a time, caused portions of it to flow backwards. Here's what didn't happen. The Mississippi River didn't flow to a particular point, stand still, let a bunch of people cross on dry land, and then resume its course when told it was allowed to start flowing again. Now that happened to the nation of Israel not once, but twice. <laughs> once on a river, once on a sea. Oh, and as a sideshow, mountains did some dancing along the way. That's the message of Psalm 114. It's a short but powerful song, uh, powerful in its recollection and its description of what God is capable of. Uh, scholars categorize this as what they call a Hallel Psalm. These are songs that are meant to praise and thank God for His personal and national deliverance. There are three different collections of Hallel Psalms in the Psalter. We have the Egyptian Hallel Psalms in 113 through 118. That's where we are tonight. There are the great Hallel Psalms, uh, most of which are also called the Songs of Ascent. Those are, uh, that's Psalm 120 through 136. Now, 120 through 134 are the Songs of Ascent, but they're all the great Hallel Psalms with 35, 135 and 136 tacked on. And then there are the final Hallel Psalms in 146 through 150. Uh, I tell you this because I'm always interested to find out just how intricate and purposeful the book of Psalms really is. There's all kinds of stuff going on in the book of Psalms, the collections, the, the, the different um, groupings of Psalms, the different styles of Psalms. There's a lot of really cool stuff in there. It's not just a big pile of 150 songs kind of just thrown there in place. There's a lot going on. Last week, we learned from Psalm 111 how important it is to remember the work of God, the acts of God on our behalf. Throughout history, as Jews observed the Passover feast, this is one of the songs they would sing together to remember what God did. Specifically, they would sing this psalm before the, the Passover meal itself. And so we want to see what they were singing, remember what they were remembering. Let's begin in verse 1. It says, When Israel came out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people who spoke a foreign language. So the Exodus was the birthday of Israel. Before the Exodus, uh, the people of God were a family. After the Exodus, they become a nation. It's their birthday. And so this song is sort of their happy birthday to you. I'm not sure if it... I'm just, that's a joke, but anyway. They lived in Egypt for more than 400 years, of course, much, uh, most of that in slavery. And yet we sense the distinction and the separation of God's people here in verse 1. They didn't know the language. It wasn't just a language barrier. We know that there was a lot of separation and distinction. They were sheltered away in the land of Goshen. Uh, foreign language here has a connotation of a barbarous tongue, a barbarous sounding language. And we know the kind of barbarity that God's people faced in Egypt, enslavement, beatings, the murder of their sons wholesale. God saw their misery. He heard their cries and he said, I'm going to come down personally and rescue you. 
left heaven to go meet with Moses, talk to them, left heaven to, to go with them through their wilderness wanderings there, the angel of the Lord. But it's interesting, being prisoners in a foreign land with a foreign language, that didn't only happen to the Jews when it came to Egypt. Some scholars believe this psalm was written after the Babylonian exile. And so for a Jewish believer in the Old Testament, if you uh, found yourself trapped in a land with a barbarous foreign tongue, that was a sign of judgment, at least after the Exodus. A, a Jew could find himself in Babylon hearing a language that was not his own and know, yeah, I am here because my nation would not go God's way even when he tried to show us mercy. Because the Lord said, hey, I'm going to save you out of Exodus. I'm going to bring you to your own land. And if you'll walk with me, if you'll listen to me, obey me, follow me, man, you're going to be established there. It's going to be so good for you. You're not going to get sick. None of your crops are going to fail. You'll never have any miscarriages. You're going to have all of these physical, temporal blessings. And no one will uproot you. And no one will come against you. And all of your enemies will fall before you. And one of you will chase a thousand, right? And so then if you're later past the exodus in Jewish history and you wake up and you realize that you're in bonded servitude or slavery or you've been brought to some weird Chaldean town and you don't understand the language going on, that was a sign of God's judgment on your nation because you wouldn't obey him. Even then, you know, we look at the Babylonian captivity. Even then, God was still willing to rescue and deliver his people. And what a, a, a wonderful, um, just comforting fact that Psalm 114 could be sung after the Egyptian captivity or the Babylonian captivity or the Roman occupation. God is always a saving deliverer. He's always willing to move on behalf of his people to rescue them, to deliver them, to snatch them out of the hands of sin and death. Meanwhile, this verse is a subtle remind, reminder that God's people are always meant to be separate. He never wanted the Jewish people to, um, to assimilate into the cultures around them. You know, and, and even though the rules of engagement are different now in the church age, God still wants us to be a separate people meaning that we belong to a different kingdom, a different way of life, a different perspective, a different mentality, that in some sense, the world we live in is speaking in a foreign tongue compared to what we're speaking. Now, people sometimes criticize Christians for the vocabulary we use, the way we speak. I saw an article today titled, How Not to Speak Christianese, and it was from uh, like a ministry website. Oh, don't speak Christianese. And it's like, okay, well, I understand what they're saying. You want to present, you know, the gospel clearly using terms that you can be sure unbelievers understand. But at the same time, it makes complete sense that we would speak differently, act differently, think differently, behave differently, attitude differently. In fact, God says that you, you should be doing all of those things differently because you are set apart. You are distinct from this world. This world is not your home. You're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven with a completely different worldview, a completely different vocabulary, a completely different way of living. Uh, we are a separate people. Verse 2 says, Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. Who's the his in this verse? A lot of commentators, most that I reference, believe it's referring to God, that Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel God's dominion. And that may be true, I mean, and I think there's a devotional aspect where that's true, but it, it doesn't really track perfectly. After all, God hasn't been mentioned yet in the psalm. He will be at the end, but he hasn't yet. And we know that the whole earth belongs to the Lord, not just Israel. It's not just like, well, I'm the God of, of Israel and not the rest of the world. That's what the God of Canaan, gods of Canaan were like, right? I love that scene. Um, where at one point we, we get to hear what the enemies of Israel are saying, and they say, okay, we're pretty sure their God is the God of the hills, so if we attack them in the valley, their God won't be able to help. And then, you know, God wipes them out. And they say, okay, well, maybe we should attack them in the hills, and then God wipes them out, right? And so God is the God of the whole earth. The earth is the Lord's and everything within. Uh, and beyond that, there's no other passage in the Old Testament that suggests the land of Judah is Yahweh's sanctuary. That's not an idea 
that is presented elsewhere. Instead, it makes more sense to other commentators and to me that the his in mind here is the family of Jacob. That's who's being talked about in verse 1. And Judah became the family of Jacob's sanctuary, Israel the family of Jacob's dominion. Because God's people who were delivered from their bondage were then given a land and they were given, uh, you know, this, this not just a space to live on the other side of the Red Sea and the other side of a Jordan, but they were also given um, a life to live, a, a religion to practice in that land. The, the song to here talks about a sanctuary and a dominion. Two things, right? Those are two different things. A sanctuary and a dominion. In other words, God freed them from Egypt, not just to go wherever they wanted, but to be together, to follow him to a particular destination that was set aside for them. And in that destination, they would have a life of comfort and commission, worship and work, rest and regency. It was a place where they would commune with God, a sanctuary, but also serve God according to his purposes, their dominion, right? Because it's true that our lives still today, now we don't have the temporal promises that the nation of Israel had. Um, Our blessings are in heavenly places, every heavenly blessing and spiritual places, right? But our lives still today in a devotional sense are God's sanctuary and his dominion. And then he gives us things to do as we commune with him in worship, right? He says that we are his special possession and that he is our possession, right? Psalm 119 says, the Lord is my possession, or your, or your version may say, the Lord is my portion. So we're the Lord's possession. He's our possession. And as we walk with him, our lives become his sanctuary and dominion. But he also gives us a life where we have a sanctuary and dominion to serve the Lord. And so within that framework here of sort of sanctuary and dominion, the people of Israel had a great deal of freedom and opportunity, right? The Lord was not going to confine them even though he gave them boundaries to their land. We talked about this a little bit last time. Israel never even got close to filling all the boundaries the Lord uh, wanted to give them. He wasn't confining them. He gave them a great deal of freedom, all sorts of opportunity. He gave them everything they needed as, as far as startup resources, right? Uh, but we see they were freed to serve. Why did God free them? Well, he saw their misery and he had compassion on them and he wanted to deliver them from their affliction. But he didn't just say, okay, you're free. We see these in movies, right? The guy who goes free from jail and they just set him free and then they just leave him outside the the front gate of the jail. And it's like, we don't care where you go, what you do. You're just, you know, go ahead. That's not what the Lord did when he set his people free from Egypt. He says, I'm bringing you out of bondage, out of slavery. I'm giving you freedom. I am giving you hope. I'm giving you all of these different things. But now you're going to come with me and we're going to go somewhere. And I am freeing you so that then you can become my servant. Of course, we want to be servants of God because he says, when you serve me, you know, it's not just about you know, you doing things for me. It's about you receiving all sorts of things from me because here's the secret. When you become my servant, you also become my son or my daughter. You also become co-inheritors of of all that he's going to give to his son and his kingdom, right? And so and so they had all of this freedom, all of this opportunity, but he freed them to serve. They were brought out from their slavery for a purpose, for multiple purposes. And it was when the people of God started abandoning those purposes that the rest of life started falling apart. When they started abandoning their purpose in the sanctuary, right? And saying, well, we don't worship God anymore. We worship the Baals. We worship the Asherahs. We worship in these other ways. We worship the golden calves that Jeroboam set up. Man, the rest of life started falling apart because they were no longer fulfilling that purpose of the sanctuary that God had given them. But on the flip side, the dominion part was an issue too. In the book of Joshua, Joshua calls the people all together and he says, hey, what's going on? You guys won't take dominion of the land. You guys need to do this. It's not just about coming to tabernacle and going through the rituals. I mean, there's a whole life to live here. There's a, there's a whole purpose that God has given you both in the tabernacle and in the territory. You need to take dominion. And they say, oh, well, it's, it's tough. 
It's tough because, you know, people are tough. And then what happens? You get to Judges, and the people of Israel weren't taking hold of their dominion. And so what happens? Well, all those Canaanite enemies were dug in and causing all these problems, and life started falling apart. And so God's people needed to take up all the aspects that the Lord was giving them, all the purposes represented here in verse 2 by sanctuary and dominion. Verse 3 says, the sea looked and fled, the Jordan turned back. You scared, bro? That's the question for the, for the seas and the, and the river. It says, the seas looked and ran away. What was it the sea saw? That question is going to be answered in a couple of verses. But at first, I just want us to note in this verse the semicolon. Uh, if you have my version, the CSB, or if you have the New King James, I check, you know, there's a semicolon there. A little piece of punctuation that indicates a pause. In this case, it was a pause of 40 years. Now, that's a semicolon. You know how, uh, you know, have you noticed that sometimes our, our president says the pause out loud? You know, he'll be talking and he says, four more years, pause, right? His semicolon was a long pause. Because God's people there in the wilderness, in the presence of the Shekinah glory of God himself, with the angel of the Lord leading them and walking with them, after all of the miracles they had seen and the, and the, you know, the plagues and everything else, they, with all, after all of that, they said, eh, we're not really sure you're for real, God, and we kind of want to go back to slavery. And so the Lord said, all right, we're going to semicolon right now. For 40 years, uh, I was going to, you know, part the Red Sea and then like 10 minutes later, part the Jordan for you so you could get to where I want you to go and you could have all of these blessings and all of this purpose and all of these other things so that you could start your fantastic new life as my special nation. Uh, you don't want to do that? All right, uh, break out the semicolon here and we're going to wait an entire generation. That semicolon in verse three is full of the faithfulness and the compassion and the grace of God, a God who's willing to wait. Wait when his people just refuse to do the thing that they should have done. A God who's willing to condescend to our level. A God who's willing to hang in there with weak and undeserving human beings because he loves us so much. Uh, I just have been fond of reminding myself, God can do whatever he wants And he chooses to be a redeemer. He chooses to be a savior. He chooses to be a God, in this case, the God of the semicolon, says, all right, I guess we'll wait in the wilderness for 40 years. I'll just hang out for 40 years until the new generation comes along who's willing to obey me, who's willing to believe me, who's willing to walk with me. It's a lot of power in that semicolon. Now, the Bible, of course, tells us Um, that God was going to come a first time, and he did. And it tells us that God is going to come again. We're in the semicolon right now, a semicolon of our own. He still has all his power, all of his loyalty, all of his kindness, all of his providence, all of the things that we read in his word are still true about him. But rest assured, the sentence will be completed. It's going to be continued because it's already been written. We talk about this sometimes with Bible prophecy that it is, you know, history written in advance. It's already written. It's already published. It's already hit the presses, right? We're just in the semicolon. And, you know, if we we boil down, you know, this aspect of the Bible that God is coming, you know, bodily the first time, and then he's coming bodily the second time, we're just in the middle here. And that sentence will come to its completion. It's not going to change. It's not going to adjust. It's not going to be a choose your own adventure. The Lord has published what's going to happen. And now we wait for the continuation of that purpose. Verse four, the mountains skip like rams, the hills like lambs. This is probably speaking of the different shaking phenomena at Mount Sinai when the Lord gave Moses the law, a lot going on there with clouds and thunder and smoke and the shaking and quaking. The language is interesting, though, according to scholars. The words here can mean alarm or it can mean joyful celebration. One commentary says it just represents the motion of the mountains. I like that. It reminds us that creation... And by that, I mean the created order out there, the mountains, the hills, the valleys, the lakes, the rivers. Creation, we know, 
is waiting and watching and groaning for the Lord's return and the completion of his work. Creation's excited about the Lord's return. While human beings are rebelling and rejecting and denying the Lord, all this in creation is like, let's go. Lord, come and redeem. Come and restore. Come and establish your kingdom. Creation is ready to move when God arrives, right? When Jesus Christ returns, he's not going to be, you know, he's not going to be delayed by a mountain. He's not going to be delayed by, oh, the river's flooded. I'll have to go around, right? Creation is going to move for him. Mountains will level themselves. Seas will dry up. Hills will split apart because creation obeys the Lord. And creation is excited about God doing his work and participating with him. Isaiah, the prophet, talked about the motion of the mountains several times in his book, at least three times. He pictures in chapter 49, mountains being leveled into a road, right? There's no greater obstacle to us as human beings than a mountain, in a sense, right? When you're learning about these explorers or people moving west, Oregon Trail, you're going to die on the mountains, right? Donner Party, they didn't die at the river, they died at the mountain, right? And so, but, but when the Lord returns, man, the mountains are like, we'll get out of the way for you. And Isaiah talks about the mountains being leveled into a road for the Lord, but that then those mountains break into joyful shouts because God is bringing back his people because God is showing compassion to the afflicted. You can read about that in Isaiah 49, beginning in verse 11. It reminds us too, what did Jesus say about our faith? He said in Matthew 17, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Now, that's a hard verse for us to understand and, and to really, you know, I, that's one of those verses where I, I feel very much like the 12, where they like later go over to Jesus and say, what are you talking about? What does that even mean? And he says, well, here's what I mean. And I'm like, yeah, we still don't get it. Still don't know what you mean, you know. Have a lot of compassion for the 12 because it's hard to understand some of those verses. But on a devotional level, it reminds us of Psalm 114, right? That the created order is ready to bow down in obedience and worship to God to move when he commands. That the mountains are orienting themselves toward wh where's Jesus? Is Jesus here? We'll flatten ourselves so that the Lord can do what he wants to do. And what a testimony that is to us of what the inclination of our heart should be because we're much more than mountains. We're created in the image of God. He has given us a free will. He has given us his revelation. He's given us all of these things. And we also can have that kind of obedience, that kind of expectation, that kind of excitement for his return. And just a reminder that, okay, I want to be ready when the Lord returns. And I want to be found obedient when the Lord returns. And I want to orient my life so that the Lord can move through me for his purposes. Verse 5 says, why was it, see? that you fled, Jordan that you turned back, mountains that you skipped like rams, hills like lambs. So in verse 3, we were told that the Red Sea and the Jordan saw something and went running. And what did they see? One translation puts this verse this way. What's wrong with you, see? Another commentator has it like this. What was with you guys, right? And it's, it's, it's kind of a, it, they're almost accusing uh, the sea and the Jordan. The answer is still coming in verse 7, but it is a good spot to remind ourselves that as our lives flow on, as the tides of life come in and out day by day, year by year, you know, sometimes the Lord might need to shake us up. Sometimes he might need us to change direction. Sometimes we may need to reverse course. Sometimes we may need to stop moving in, in the direction we've been flowing if the Lord comes along and says, I want to do something different in your life. You've been flowing this way for a long time, and that's not necessarily bad. The Jordan River flowing was a really good thing, but then the Lord showed up at that one point when, in the history of the children of Israel, and he said, I'd like you to stop I'd like you to do something completely different, something maybe you didn't realize you could do, but you can do it in my power. And sometimes the Lord just comes along and he wants to shake us. He wants to do something new in our lives. He wants to change the direction of our lives, not in a weird way in the sense of, well, I'm just always looking for something new and crazy to do and say it was the Lord that made me do it. But, but it's true that the Lord comes along and he says, hey, I, I sometimes have new things for you to do. 
different directions to take, uh, different paths for you to walk in. Remember, God wants our lives to be a visible testimony of His grace and His power and His truth and His trustworthiness. He wants people to look at our lives and say, why are you different? Why are you going that way? Why are you distinct? Hey, you talk about God. Your God seems to be doing things in your life. Can you tell me a little bit more about Him? If we only always flow the same way as all the other rivers around us, well, what notice would anyone take? If we just look like all the other tributaries that are around us, why would anyone pause and say, hey, wait a minute, how come you're flowing backwards? Hey, wait a minute, how come, how come there's such a different aspect to your life, to your perspective, to your attitudes, to your language, to all of these different things? We are supposed to demonstrate a God who acts differently. He says, I set you apart, so apart that it's as different as light is from darkness, right? so that we will shine the light of the gospel in a world that is in so, uh, such darkness. Verse 7, tremble earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. So what did the sea see? Why did the mountains move? It wasn't because of Moses. It wasn't because of the group of people on the shore. It was the Lord. That's what they saw, right? So the Red Sea... And the Jordan River, in this song, it turned and looked, and what did it see? The presence of God Almighty. And it was like, whoa, we better get out of the way. They didn't care at all about the people or the animals or Moses himself. They said, man, we see the Lord. And when the Lord shows up, we're like, what do you need us to do? <laughs> we'll flow the other way if you need us to. That's what they saw. It was his presence. He came and everything changed. He spoke, he directed, he decided, and everything fell into place as a result in a remarkable way. In verse 7, God is referred to in two ways, the Lord and the God of Jacob. The one true God has chosen to attach himself to people. The God of Jacob. That's his name for himself. I'm the God of Jacob. That was his idea. It was his plan. He called Abraham. He said, come over here. I want to make a whole people out of you. I want to become your God. Let me introduce myself to you. You were worshiping here in the Earl of the Chaldees, a bunch of, you know, a bunch of idols that weren't God. Come over here. I want to tell you who I am. I want to become your God. I want to attach myself to you and to your family and to all of your descendants and all the people that we brought into your spiritual family through faith and belief. God would come to Isaac or to Jacob at times in the book of Genesis. And what did he say? He would say to them, hey, I'm the God of your father. Not because they went and found him, but because he came and found them. He gives himself to us. He shares his presence with his people. He says, I am yours and you are mine. Let's dwell together. Let's walk together. Let's work together. <clears throat> David understood this. He said, man, there's nowhere I could go to escape your presence, Lord. There's nowhere I could go where I'm, I'm apart from your spirit. He's with us always to the end of the age, bringing times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. That's what the Acts 3.20 says. At times of refreshing come into our lives because of the, it comes from the presence of God. God who could be anywhere he wants to be, do whatever he wants to do. He says, I want to spend time with you. I want to refresh your soul. I want to refresh your life. I want to pour into you all of these spiritual blessings from heavenly places because I love you, because I have attached myself to you. I have committed myself to you. I have loyal, faithful, undying love for you. We're called to tremble at his presence along with the rest of the earth. The term, of course, can mean a reverent fear, the, you know, the sort of terrifying awe of an all-powerful God acknowledging his greatness and his ability. But scholars tell us this also means to tremble here, means to whirl in rejoicing, to celebrate the nearness of this God who has given himself to us in such a gracious, compassionate, personal, tender way. That we should just be celebrating, man, God loves us and is with us, and he chooses to be in 92 degree heat with us in Hanford, right? Verse 8, who turned the rock into a pool, the flint into a spring. So not only did God part the waters so his people could cross, he did so much more. These earthquakes made the Mississippi flow backwards for a little bit of time back in the 1800s. That's a big deal. 
But here, it, the Lord goes so much further. He says, oh, man, my people need water in the wilderness. Why are they in the wilderness? They're in the wilderness because they wouldn't believe you. They wouldn't obey you. And he says, all right, well, here we are hanging out 40 years. My people need water. I could say, yeah, you need water. And this is what you got. You know, this is what happens when you refuse to go into a promised land that was flowing with milk and honey. You chose to be in a wilderness with no water. Deal with it. Figure it out. And instead, he says, my people need water. You know what I'll do? I'll make water flow out of rock. Find, let's see that big rock over there? Start smacking that thing. And water is going to start leaking out, gushing out, flowing out. Of course, that was a beautiful symbol of Christ's redemptive work, his provision for us. But it was also an actual rock, an actual rock that started leaking water to feed thousands upon thousands of people and animals as much as they needed, as much as they wanted. You didn't need a life straw to drink the water, right? We have a life straw at home. And uh, the thing's awesome. You can stick it into any gross puddle and drink it and probably not die. But, <laughs> but no, the Lord says, man, we got a wilderness out here. There's no water. We got a rock. That's fine. It's going to flow with pure living water. And not only that, not only did he do the impossible, not only did he act so gracious and compassionately toward people who re were refusing to believe him, he says, okay, not only am I going to supply you with water out of a rock, that rock's going to follow you around. I love there's a portion of the scripture that talks about how that rock followed them. I don't know if they could watch it moving or if they just, you know, woke up and it was there in the camp when they would move. But it followed them around because he says, I'll keep providing you water. I will keep giving you what you need day after day after day. I am not going to strand you in this wilderness. I am not going to abandon you in this wilderness. Even though you kind of deserve it, I'll be with you and I'll provide for you. This is what God does to accomplish his good purposes, to save, to deliver, to direct, to transform the lives of his people. This is the distance he will go. This is what he's capable of. Psalm 114, it's a pretty short song, but the simple reminder packs a punch. There is so much that the Lord wants to do and is willing to do on our behalf. Look at what he does. And when we do, we realize that there is never a reason for us to tell God, yeah, well, but God, in my situation, I can't do what you've asked me to do. It's too hard. In my situation, I can't overcome this problem or I can't face or I can't continue or I can't X, Y, or Z. I just can't do it. It's too much. It's not. The Lord says, I can make water flow out of a rock in the wilderness and I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. James Smith writes, the Hebrew in verse 8 uses a timeless participle in this last sentence, which suggests the continuing provision for his people. And what did Jesus say? He said, man, rivers of living water are going to flow through your life. If you walk with me, if you obey me, if you devote yourself to me, commune with me, God still provides living water, even in a wilderness. He still moves mountains. He still makes a way and still calls us to join him, walk with him. What does he say? He says, this is the way, walk in it so that he can give us purpose, so that he can give us rest, so he can transform our lives and do more than we ever ask or imagine. And he promises, I'm going to walk with you the whole way, giving us his presence, his tenderness, his careful attention, his grace, always guiding and providing and accomplishing his good work. So let's be the people who rejoice in his presence, who watch for his coming, who reverse the flow of our lives if he asks us, who trusts that he knows the way, that he knows the best timing, that he knows what he's doing, and then do those things with him so that we can worship and work according to his good and gracious purposes for us.